In this tutorial, we're going to create text in OpenGL by using the FreeType library and TrueType fonts. The source code is based on tutorial 5, model loading part 1, but I've decided to remove the model loading sections of the code so we can focus purely on rendering text. However, near the end of the video, I'll re-enable model loading to demonstrate how to transform text within object space, just like when transforming and rendering 3D models. Let's start by downloading the appropriate FreeType pre-built binary and then adding the header file, library file and DLL file to our project as I'm demonstrating here. We copy the header file to the includes folder, the lib file to the libraries folder and the DLL file to the release folder. Then as usual we need to make sure that the release and x64 options are selected and then let the compiler know where to find the relevant files and to link with the lib file. It'll make things easier if you simply copy and paste the code into your project from the link in the description. But for now, if you just want to check that FreeType compiles without any errors, you need to include its build header file and FreeType header macro, then add these few lines of code and then build the solution. Next, inside your release folder you need to create a fonts folder, which is where you'll be keeping your chosen font files. You'll find the fonts that are installed on your computer in the Windows fonts folder. Select View Details, then right click on the column headers section and select font file names to see the file type extensions. I found that the open type fonts also work in addition to the true type fonts, so you can also copy and paste any open type font into your text fonts folder. All you need to do now to display some text is to include the text fonts glyphs header file, enable the sections of code as shown here in the main CPP file, add these few lines of code for your vertex shader, add these few lines of code for your fragment shader, and then recompile the program. So now let's take a closer look at what the code is actually doing. The text class contains all of the functionality required for processing and displaying text. Therefore, the first step is to declare an instance of the text class and then for us to take a quick look at each of its functions. Let's start with the class constructor, which accepts a reference to an instance of the free type library, which is declared in the main function, the display window size and your chosen alphabet string. Within the body of the constructor we set the two scaling variables which are used to convert OpenGL's NDC cube range minus 1 to plus 1 to screen pixels by dividing 2 by the window's width and height. The create text message function calls all of the other class functions in turn, apart from the draw functions which are called from within the main loop. We call the create text message function before the main loop starts back in the main CPP file. Our arguments are the message we want to display the start position margin in pixels from the top left corner of the window, the font, the font size, and whether or not the message is likely to change. A new alphabet is created for any new message that has either a different font or font size, or both, but if an existing message already uses the same font and size, we record its index position. Next we declare a new message instance of the message parent struct, which contains all of the variables for controlling various parameters. We set the font size and font path, followed by calling the setFontParameters function, which loads the font and sets its size. When creating a blank texture, we use glNearest as the filtering type, because we want to use the glyph's bitmap values without them being mixed with neighbouring pixel values. Calculating the alphabet image size requires looping through all of the characters. For the width, we simply add up all the character widths, but for the height, we determine the tallest character and then multiply that value by the number of rows. You can adjust the alphabet row limit and the character spacing by setting these two values. Each true type character of the alphabet is processed by free type and then provided to us as a glyph in the form of an 8-bit grayscale bitmap image. Therefore we need to apply that image data to an OpenGL texture. To apply the glyph's bitmap data to the texture, we start by formatting the texture to the alphabet's image size that we just calculated and we also provide a pointer to a blank vector of image data. Notice that we're using GL Red for the colour format, as opposed to the more typical Red Green Blue and Red Green Blue Alpha formats, which is because for each character, we're using an 8-bit grayscale value to represent a single GL Red value, which also requires one byte. We then modify that data by looping through all of the alphabet characters and applying each character's bitmap data to the bound alphabet texture. FreeType uses values in the range 0 to 1 for the bitmaps that it generates. Near the edges of each character, it uses the full range of 0 to 1 to produce anti-aliasing, where 0 represents fully transparent and 1 represents fully opaque. 
all the other characters' pixels are set to 1. Therefore, by accessing the texture's red channel, we can then use those values to control the colour of the fragment in different ways. For example, within this slightly modified fragment shader, we can use the texture's red value as the transparency value, which then results in anti-alias characters for any combination of OpenGL's red, green and blue colour channels. Or we can set a specific background colour by targeting zero values, and we can even modify only the pixels that form the anti-aliasing by targeting values between 0 and 1. The relative distance variable is used in the vertical alignment calculation which we'll look at later, whereby the position of the topmost pixels along the text row are precisely controlled, making it possible to precisely align the text to the top of the window. Four different bitmap variables and one glyph variable are used to control the position of each bitmap image, which are bitmap width, bitmap rows, which is the glyph's height, bitmap left and bitmap top, which are used to move each character either horizontally or vertically to produce the correct relative character horizontal spacing or vertical alignment, and finally the glyph's horizontal advance value, which also takes part in the horizontal spacing calculation, which we'll also look at later. The texture coordinates are simply set to the first and last pixels of the character's bitmap image, as positioned in the alphabet texture, by dividing that position in pixels by the texture's size in pixels, thereby converting to the range 0 to 1, as required by OpenGL. This last section simply causes the alphabet characters to begin on a new row. Note that both the padding and the characters per row setting make no difference to the message's character spacing and alignment. They're simply optional for making the alphabets appear better spaced out when choosing to display them. The alphabet image quad is used for when choosing to display the alphabet. Its vertex positions are set to the alphabet's texture size as calculated previously, and its texture coordinates are set to values 0 and 1, which corresponds to the entire texture. The alphabet's buffer data is set the same as demonstrated in previous tutorials. Each new message string is looped through and compared with the alphabet characters, and when they match, each character is then processed within the processed text index function. Notice that the start x and y position values are set based on the message's first character, which is when the advance value equals zero. Within the processed text index function, I've assigned all the relevant class variables to new shorter name variables for clarity's sake. Similar to the alphabet's quad, all we're doing here is setting each character's quad's vertex position values and texture coordinates. Finally, we now add the current character quad to the message's list of character quads. We then initialize the message's buffer data similar to as done for the alphabet, but we provide either dynamic or static for the usage parameter, depending on whether or not the message's text will be updated. Also notice that at this stage, we're providing null as the pointer argument, instead of pointing to the message's list of character quads. The final function call is where the buffer object gets updated with the pointer address of the message's list of character quads. GL buffer data performs the task of allocating memory for the VBO, which is generally considered an expensive task, so it's worth avoiding, which is why we're using GL buffer subdata for updating the buffer, such as when displaying a timer for example. The final task before we return to the main function is to simply add the new message to the list of messages. The three structs at the beginning of the class contain all the variables that are accessed in the various functions that we've just looked at. The draw functions are the same as in previous tutorials, apart from that we now have to disable depth testing to make sure that the boundaries of adjacent character quads don't rub out parts of each other's text. Alternatively, you can discard all the fragments that have a bitmap value of zero, which is the method we'll be using later on for 3D text animation. It's definitely worth understanding some of the glyph metrics that are being used to position and align the font characters, in particular bearing X, bearing Y and the horizontal advance. Bearing X is any given character's horizontal left offset relative to its origin, which although typically are positive values, they are indeed sometimes negative, thereby causing character quads to overlap. Likewise, bearing Y is a character's vertical offset relative to its origin which causes the lower part of a character's bitmap to be positioned below the origin if necessary. The horizontal advance is the distance that a character needs to step past the previous character's position. It's important to note that the horizontal advance value is applied relative to whatever the previous character's position value was before the previous character's position was adjusted by its bearing X offset value. Let's now take another quick look at both shaders, which are both very simple. The vertex shader passes the texture coordinates to the fragment shader and also outputs the vertex position. 
Because we're currently working directly with OpenGL's normalized device coordinates, it means that multiplying by a view projection matrix doesn't apply. The fragment shader requires just a single texture function call. We divide the font color red, green, blue values by 255 to convert them to the range 0 to 1, and we access just the R component of the texture. Let's now uncomment the relevant sections of code required to produce a timer. We can continuously update any specific number of characters from the end of any message by reducing the size of its character quad vector, and then repopulating it with characters of our choice from the message's alphabet. This is the code that creates the three digit counter and extracts each digit to be used individually. Converting 2D text to display as 3D animated text requires the following. We need to uncomment these two lines and comment these two lines, and then choose the XY object space coordinates that we want to use as the start position for the text. You can set the Z value directly in the vertex shader. We need to make sure the padding variable is set to above zero, because by transforming the vertex positions, it causes the resulting pixel selection of the texture coordinates as read from the glyphs bitmap image to no longer precisely correspond to the screen pixel coordinates on a one-to-one -one basis, which can therefore produce a very slight overlapping of the characters. Similarly, we need to change the texture's minify filter and magnify filter settings from GL nearest to GL linear, as a method for producing smoother text due to the anti-aliasing also being affected by there no longer being a precise one-to-one -one pixel correspondence. Next is to re-enable depth testing, so that the text isn't visible when positioned behind other models in object space. But then as an alternative to disabling depth testing, we need to now discard all the fragments that have a bitmap value of zero, as done here in this slightly modified version of the fragment shader. We also need to use this slightly modified version of the vertex shader. Finally, you need to add the camera, the view matrix and the projection matrix, and then choose how you want to transform your text, such as rotating it on the spot, and then transfer the matrices to the vertex shader and then recompile the program. This first timer example counts upwards to 300 and then resets to zero, whilst rotating the message on the spot. It's also setting the color values within the fragment shader based on the animating vertex positions. For this second timer example, notice that I'm now also using Tutorial 5's model loading code, which includes the load model meshes class, STB image loader, the relevant sections within the main CPP file, and the two extra shaders. I've also modified how the characters are replaced, such that it now inserts a minus sign when passing zero, thereby operating as a plus minus timer. If you're not already using Tutorial 5 model loading part 1 as your starting point, then you can also add in the relevant parts of the code from that tutorial. And then for example, if we want to transform the message as if it belongs to a particular 3D model, we can then open that model in Blender to determine the desired start position values. By multiplying the text's positional values by the same sequence of transformation matrices as the helicopter, the text is thereby automatically being treated as existing in object space. If you found this tutorial interesting, then please give it the thumbs up and you can also subscribe to my channel ready for the next series. Cheerio for now.